Check, check. One, two. Check, check.
That'll be the speaker. All right, I'm tilting this one up for the speaker. Testing. Okay. Now, my hands around. So let's get it where I'm not going to. Yeah, I am. So let's do it so I'm not going to catch it. Okay. That looks pretty good. As long as most of the wire is down in my. Oh, you got another one. Okay. This one, I think I'm going to slide on you. Is that okay or is that goofy for you? It's okay. So okay. you, you did the TV. I don't I wonder what it is. They won't interfere or I don't think so. Okay. 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 So I'm gonna do what I normally do here. Okay. I'm gonna wrap this up here. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm just I have done that before. <laughs> you know, yep. what? but out the thing, excuse me, out the thing comes and falls on the floor. <laughs> Yeah. Go that way. Go this way. There's a certain way to loop it. Oh, okay. There we go. Okay. This, it's it's this microphone. It's not me or you. Okay. This thing's just a little goofy here. So okay. Yeah. I'm gonna. Yeah. MacGyver stuff here. Okay, do a little more. Okay. It's going to be, I think we're okay. Good. Okay. Thank you. Got you, totally oh no, okay, got another one. Yeah, that one's for the video. Oh no, it looks like I got two. I got two. I got one in my pocket. Okay. So this one's on, I think. Oh, yeah. In my pocket. Oh yeah, we can hear him. Yeah, he's up. Okay. 
Okay, I'll need a mic. So I'm going to introduce the student. Okay. Who will then introduce introduce you. me? Would, you have a okay. Okay. So once you have a seat over there by Shri, uh, okay. Down and he'll introduce you. Okay. You okay. Okay. Or you want? Okay. Yeah, that's fine. So you do the honors, do you? <laughs> okay. Just, 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 just. You told me I'm to sit by you, and I'll slip out when I. Uh... Okay. You're from Princeton. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, you said New Jersey. Okay. Oh. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. What town are you from? Montgomery. Okay. Yeah, I've heard of it. When I lived there for a year twice. So. Okay. Yeah. Welcome, everyone. Okay. Welcome. It's a terrific, terrific crowd. Thank you. My name, my name is Philip Munoz. I'm a professor here in political science, and I'm the director of the Center for Citizenship and Constitutional Government. It's my pleasure. Uh, to welcome you uh, back for the fall, uh, spring semester, for it's our first uh, event for the semester. Uh, and we're starting off with a bang. Um, just a few announcements and uh, thank yous. Uh, first of all, I should say a little bit about the center. The, the center exists to foster research and teaching about the fundamental principles of constitutionalism, especially about American constitutionalism, our natural rights traditions, our uh, debates about equality and liberty, and how those play out politically and legally. Um, for you undergraduates, the center administers the College of Liberal Arts minor in constitutional studies. Uh, so if you're interested in events like today's, interested in questions of law and justice, both historically, philosophically, legally, um, it's uh, five courses, um, and you can do it with any major. So I invite you to come talk to me or Debbie O'Malley, um, our associate director, or Soren Greffenstadt, and learn about the, the minor. It's one of the biggest in the College of Arts and Letters. Um, and we're uh, uh, available to any student in any college. So uh, learn about the minor. You can see about our events on our website, uh, 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 constudies.nd.edu. Let me just uh, put a few future dates uh, on your calendar. Um, we have a lot of events this spring, uh, but three I want to highlight, uh, which I think are going to be especially good. On March 24th, which is a Friday, I believe at 5 p.m., we're doing a, d a debate or a conversation uh, between two very interesting gentlemen. The topic is, how moral are markets? Are our markets moral? And it's going to be a, a, a debate between uh, Jim Otteson, who's a professor here in the business school, uh, very dis Adam Smith scholar, very distinguished, and uh, Michael Anton, uh, the, um, a well-known writer. <laughs> <laughs> so that should be quite good. Looking forward to that one. So that's going to be at 5 o'clock on March 24th, which is a Friday. Um, Soren, do we know where that is? In the Jordan Auditorium. Okay, so there'll be lots of room for everyone. So uh, that should be quite good. For your students, um, that, that debate is part of a conference sponsored by the Intercollegiate Studies Institute that's here in uh, South Bend. It should be a quite a good conference. Uh, a number of Notre Dame uh, professors are speaking at it. So um, you might look uh, to, to spend the whole weekend uh, with us in the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. Two other dates for you. On April 17th, which is a Monday at, at 12.30, and we'll have a noon uh, lunch beforehand, a gentleman named, a professor named Carl Truman will be here speaking. Some of you might have heard of his book. Um, I'll just look, make sure I get the title right. Um, it's about the invention of the modern self. The, the, uh, the title escapes me. Um, uh, it's, in my estimation, one of the most important books written this century. Uh, it's phenomenally interesting. And he's an especially gifted speaker. So it, um, it, he's a, a wonderful, um, he, he's a Protestant minister. So he, you know, he knows how to hold a crowd. Um, that's on Monday, April 17th. Um, the Invention of the Modern Self is the theme of his, his book. Uh, and then the following week on Wednesday, um, April 26th, this is an event I'm especially uh, happy to announce, uh, Harvey Mansfield Jr., arguably the most distinguished political scientist in America, perhaps the world. Uh, he's 90 years old. Uh, we figured we should get him now while we, while we can. Um, so he's going to be giving a lecture on Tocqueville. And his lecture and today's lecture 
I'm, pl I'm pleased to announce are part of a new series we're starting at the center. Uh, we're calling it our, um, our core text lecture series. And the idea is over the next 10 years or so, we're going to invite speakers like Professor Stoner to come give uh, general lectures on core text or core ideas. So Harvey Mansfield will be giving a lecture on Tocqueville. And I've asked him to say, you have 45 minutes. Tell us everything we need to know about Tocqueville in 45 minutes. And we're going to put together a lecture series of the most distinguished individuals talking about the most important ideas. Uh, and we'll put that up on our website. Uh, so something we can hand down to uh, future generations. So please join us. That's not all the events we have, but please join us uh, for those events. Go to our website. You can see everything uh, we're doing. One other thing we do at the center is we want, run our undergraduate fellows program, the Tocqueville Fellows. Uh, the Tocqueville Fellows, for those students who might be interested, they meet with our speakers. They, they help us come up with ideas. They participate in private seminars. Um, so we had a, a seminar with uh, Professor Stoner this morning, just sat around talking about the philosophy of the Declaration of Independence and other things. Um, and they help us introduce our speakers. So I'm going to call the podium uh, Shri Akur. He's a freshman from New Jersey, right? And Shri will introduce Professor Stoner. Hello, everyone. Good, af good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. James R. Stoner, Jr. is the Herman Moist, Jr. Professor and Director of the Eric Vogelin Institute in the Department of Political Science at Louisiana State University, where he has taught since 1988. He is the author of Common Law Liberty and Common Law and Liberal Theory, and co-author of five books, most recently, The Political Thought of the Civil War with Adam Allen Levine and Thomas Merrill, um, and Free Speech and Intellectual Diversity in Higher Education with Paul O'Kares and Carol McNamara. He was twice a visiting fellow at, in the James Madison program at Princeton University, and the second time is a Garwood professor. He earned his bachelor's degree from Middlebury College and his PhD from Harvard University. And the title of his lecture today is Catholicism and Constitutionalism in American Perspective. Please join me in welcoming Professor Stoner. Okay, hey, listen, yeah. Thank you, sir. I don't think I need it. Well, thank you very much. And uh, it's always a great honor to speak at Notre Dame. And, uh, to uh, initiate this series with the Center for Citizenship and Constitutional Government here. And uh, uh, good to see so many uh, friends in the audience uh, and even a few Louisianians, so uh, uh, fellow Louisianians, I should say. I suppose it should come as no surprise in our polarized era that opinions on my topic today, Catholicism and constitutionalism, are similarly at odds. On the one hand, is the view that we might call liberal or progressive liberal, that sees religion as a private matter according to the Constitution, uh, permitted to individuals who find it to their liking or even think it constitutive of their identity, but not to be allowed to interfere, uh, sometimes even just by exhortation, with the autonomous choices of others, which Catholics and other Christians occasionally seem to want to do. On the other hand, are our Neo-integralist friends who, accepting the liberal in interpretation of the Constitution and observing the social corruption that autonomous individualism has wrought, show little patience and sometimes even contempt for our constitutional order, seeking policies to address our social crisis with little regard for constitutional niceties. Today, I want to argue that contrary to both polarities, Catholicism and constitutionalism are deeply compatible historically, legally, and anthropologically. Not the compatibility of a long married couple sitting peacefully by the fire with their grandchildren playing happily at their feet, but in a dynamic relationship characterized at times by structured conflict and at times by constructive dialogue, but one which allows us, indeed invites us, to be faithful Catholics and good citizens, even patriotic citizens, at the same time. I'm going to start by placing this American constitutionalism in sweeping historical and theoretical perspective, and then we'll turn to the American founding and to our contemporary 
uh, predicaments, although rather briefly. So bear with me if you think I'm floating too high above the surface with my remarks. When we get to the question period off the South Carolina coast, you can try to shoot them down. <laughs> now, I won't speculate as to the origin of politics, but I will begin by noting that politics takes its name from the ancient Greek polis that emerged sometime uh, before the fifth century BC and was described by its foremost analyst, Aristotle, as a community of men and women sharing a common life and a common understanding of what is just and unjust, noble and base, advantageous and harmful. Or maybe more accurately, as depicted not only by Aristotle, but more especially by historians such as Herodotus and Thucydides, as engaged in a struggle to rule according to these ideas and to act in unison, especially on the battlefield. The Greeks had slaves, but the polis was an association of the free. And they not only fought together, but typically held assemblies and deliberated over war and peace, whom to elect to office, whom to convict of crimes, and whether to change the laws. Aristotle thought the key to understanding any polis was to identify its regime, uh, which is the term by which I'm translating the Greek word politeia, which can also be translated as constitution or transliterated as polity or going through the Latin as republic. Aristotle thought there were several types of regime. He names kingship, aristocracy, democracy, oligarchy, and tyranny, as well as one that goes by the generic name, polity, or constitutional government. And he thought they could be distinguished according to the number who ruled and whether they ruled for the common good or for their own advantage as rulers. The good regimes aimed at the common good and most especially at virtue. A good city shared together a life of virtue and took care to cultivate and ensure the virtue of their citizens. Since good men are hard to find, the best regime most cities could hope for would be a polity or constitutional republic, where the rich, the poor, and the middle class all shared in government, with the middle class predominating, where military virtue was widespread and the laws were respected. It should be noted that the Greeks worshipped a number of different gods, their temp temples and cults differing city to city. And Aristotle mentions in passing the office of priest, apparently reserved, believe it or not, for retired politicians. In the early days, the cult of the city appears to have been more central to political life, with kings serving as chief priests. But the four, fifth and four, but by the fifth and fourth century, writers were more interested in the deliberation of assemblies and the exploits of those elected to be generals. Democratic Athens retained an office called king who was apparently responsible for sacrifices but played no evident political role. Now, Aristotle and his teacher Plato held that the city existed by nature. That is, it fulfilled the needs of human nature with Plato going so far as to develop in his Republic a book uh, that's the traditional title, Republic, but the Greek title is Politeia, again, that same word. Plato went so far as to develop an analogy between the parts of the city and the parts of the soul. But Plato and Aristotle were also critics of actually established cities, particularly for their inability to include space for the philosophic life, as proven by Athens' execution of Socrates, the city where philosophy most thrived nevertheless put to death its leading philosopher. Plato's proposal that, uh, as reparation, so to speak, philosophers be made kings is generally read to indicate the limits of politics rather than to propose a serious possibility. And Aristotle too contrasts the philosophic life and the political life, presenting them as the noblest alternatives for able men, saying the philosophic is best in itself, but too high for man, at least as something continuous and exclusive. What the Greeks thought was soon enough eclipsed by the fact of Rome. The polis, indeed a polity or republic, that conquered the Medita Mediterranean world and undid itself in the process, becoming an empire, a form known to the Greeks from the Persians, their mortal enemy, and thereby, I think, discrediting Greek political thought for more than a millennium. 
St. Augustine was, of course, a critic of Rome, as well as a Roman citizen. And his great work of political theology, The City of God, introduced a new epoch in political thought. For he introduced, or rather gave theoretical expression to, the church, which he described as a city, or rather as a city and not a city, like a city in its unity and its devotion to virtue as its end, not like an ordinary city in finding its unity in heaven and its happiness in the beatific vision. Christ, of course, lived on earth in the time of Augustus Caesar and his successor Tiberius and told Caesar's agent, Pontius Pilate, that his kingdom, not Pilate's, but his own, was not of this world. But already St. Paul refers to the community of believers as the ecclesia, the word the Athenians had used for their assembly. The city of man, or the earthly city, aimed at glory, according to Augustine. And while it inspired acts of extraordinary virtue, its basis was human pride, a sin. The city of God or heavenly city had the true end, the glory of God, and the virtues of its members are the virtues of holiness. But while the earthly city is easy enough to recognize and to deplore, Augustine asks whether it's even different from a gang of robbers. The heavenly city is complicated since it entails both the saints in heaven and the visible church on earth, or rather all of the former and the holy among the latter so that there are two interminglings in the church, the intermingling of those in heaven and those on earth, and in the city of man, those who are members of the church, as well as the citizens of the city who are not. While Augustine is clear that not everyone who participates in the visible life of the church is destined for eternal membership, he is also clear that it is possible for a good Christian to be a good citizen, even though every earthly city is imperfect. He praises Christian emperors, exonerates Christian judges, and justifies Christian warriors. The peace of the earthly city, imperfect though it is, protects the life of the church, even as the church thus lends to the city upright women and men. Now, Augustine's city of God might be said to have raised or theorized the problem of political life in the Christian era, especially in the Middle Ages, the history of which was once widely known and uh, tremendously complicated, at least in Europe, including, for example, Byzantium in the East and the rise of national kingships in the West, most of which eventually followed a pattern of hereditary monarch monarchies containing hereditary barons and feudal lords on the one hand, and on the other, a complex structure of bishops under the Pope, as well as monasteries and convents, with bishops and abbots often mixing with the nobles in royal councils. Often enough, they hailed from the same families, after all. Not to mention the Holy Roman Emperor, elected by some of the German princes and the free cities. And some of those free cities, we following all this, some of those free cities actually ruled by prince bishops, they're called. Uh, and that's not even to mention the universities, which were part of this structure, too. Now, I imagine that at Notre Dame, even in this audience, there are plenty of people who could tell you more in 15 minutes about these matters than I could claim ever to have learned. But I do want to make a few observations. First, I think it's fair to call these complex structures constitutional, even in the Aristotelian sense, for they mix together different classes in society. Not now rich and poor, though burghers were sometimes included, at least in the governance of their towns, but lay and religious. And they structure their roles and relations according to law. Second, the different officers were assigned different responsibilities or jurisdictions. And indeed, questions of jurisdiction structured many of the debates. Third, at least in the Christian kingships, law was typically or eventually patterned upon Christian morality. So, for example, marriage was held to require the free consent of the parties to be uh, monogamous and to last for life. And of course, to be between a man and a woman. Fourth, I think it might be said that the state deputed to the church responsibility for forging the agreement of the people as to the just, the noble, and the advantageous, as Aristotle had spoken of, these now being defined by church doctrines and deviations punished by the state as the crime of heresy. Of course, precisely how Christian those laws were is a matter of no little dispute. 
Christ in the gospel, preached to the poor and pra uh, praised and promised their access to his kingdom. But these kingdoms and their churches were famously hierarchical. But it still might be said that the law defined rights for all, even if more rights for some. In England, at least, in the Magna Carta of 1215, rights of what they and we call due process were guaranteed to all free men and some rights to women too. Now, medieval Christianity produced numerous legal documents and extensive commentaries, but few works that today we recognize as classics of political theory. Though a young Jesuit PhD in political science, William McCormick, has argued that Thomas Aquinas's tract on kingship to the king of Cyprus deserves to be considered such. McCormick rightly, I think, situates Aquinas between Aristotle and Augustine, drawing from the former the natural goodness of the city, its capacity to allow free men participation in the common good, and to solicit from a king superlative virtue, while at the same time drawing from Augustine a lively sense of the sinfulness of most actual politics and the temptation in politics towards tyranny, and thus of the need for redemption and the promise of heavenly reward to make politics whole. Although McCormick praises Aquinas for focusing on the person of the king rather than on jurisdictional disputes between the institutional church and the institutional state, he endorses Aquinas' dualism between the temporal and the spiritual, his clear subordination of the former to the latter, and his insistence both that the king act to lead uh, his subjects towards salvation and that he subordinate himself to the pope. Aquinas desacralizes kingship, according to McCormick, and like Augustine, denounces civil religion, that is, the subordination of religion to the needs of the state. He likewise eschews theocracy, for the king has his proper duties, and these can no more be given to priests than uh, priestly faculties given to a king. Still, in the grand scheme of things, as the natural good of happiness points towards and thus ultimately yields to, the supreme good of heavenly beatitude. So natural and worldly honor due to a good king must ultimately bend and acknowledge the spirit, bend to and acknowledge the spiritual authority of the Holy Father. Although McCormick sees on kingship as designed to fit the genre of mirrors of princes and is attuned throughout to Aquinas's rhetorical uh, uh, constraints in addressing a prince, not as in the Summa addressing students of theology, and to Aquinas's pedagogical intention in turning an actual prince towards justice and charity, he nevertheless takes at face value Aquinas's assertion that monarchy is the best regime, and that the startling statement a few chapters later, indicating with Salus that men in monarchies, quote, strive more sluggishly for the common good than in a republic where, quote, each one attends to it as though it were his own. Uh, this statement, I think, is uh, undercut, or, or, or McCormick thinks this statement is undercut by the critique of polyarchy that follows soon after, whose content, uh, continued dissensions lead to civil war. McCormick acknowledges that, at least in principle, some of what Aquinas says of and to the king might apply to a single council or a united people. But whatever might be said of St. Thomas's apparent endorsement of the mixed regime uh, in the Summa, kingship remains preeminent in this little tract. The king, Aquinas stre stresses, is a minister of God, even at one point compared to God in an analogy. On the one hand, the king is reminded he is less than God and dependent upon him. On the other hand, kingship itself is, exalt is exalted among the cities. But what if kingship were to appear not as a permanent best, but as owing its prestige only to the collapse of classical republicanism in Rome? What if a new principle of unity, say a constitution, were to emerge that mooted Aquinas's chief argument for kingship, that it provides a principle of unity leading to peace, and that thus could tap the potential of human action alluded to in Aquinas's reference to Sallust, quoted a moment ago. What if this could be achieved without undermining the unity or hierarchy of the church herself, 
whose principle of organization, superficially similar to feudal monarchy, in fact stems from a very different calling. Something like this seems to have been on the verge of happening in the Italian republics of the several centuries after Aquinas' death, issuing in the Renaissance humanism whose political principles historian James Hankins is aiming to bring to our attention. In the history of political thought as generally known, however, this movement was diverted at its source by the brilliant work of Machiavelli, who simultaneously reconceived the mirror of princes into a how-to manual for enterprising individuals and reimagined republicanism through a reinterpretation of the history of Rome, seeing in the civil unrest between patrician and plebs, uh, patricians and plebs, the secret of Roman vitality, not the cause of Roman decline. What began as an attempt to recover the nobility of political life became an effort to promote the debasement of the spiritual, or if that's too harsh, to at least turn the human spirit exclusively toward the temporal or worldly things. Coupled with the discovery uh, the discoveries of the astronomers that Aristotle had in fact been wrong about the heavens and more generally about motion, there arose the suspicion that he might have been wrong also about man in the city, about justice and virtue and all the rest. In the 17th century, in the sh shadow of Galileo, Thomas Hobbes makes this explicit, treating man as a body in motion according to the laws of momentum and calling this natural rights predicting collision and chaos, and devising the notion of a sovereign power to create an artificial peace while leaving men otherwise free to pursue their desires. With Hobbes, liberalism is born, though the term won't come into use until the 19th century. And Hobbes explains more clearly than any of his successors the unleashing of individual desire from moral censure, at least in private matters, the need for a powerful state as a result to keep individual autonomy from descending into anarchy, and thus the interconnection between these two seemingly opposite tendencies. The, 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 the free and uh, autonomous individual on the one hand, the powerful central state on the other. Hobbes's ideas are refined first by John Locke, who adds property as a natural right and explains how unleashing men's desires while rewarding them with the product of their labor can ensure plenty, and who also uh, limits uh, on, uh, adds limits on government to ensure that plenty is preserved and not squandered. And then it's further refined, I, I remember I'm floating across the whole story, right? Further refined by Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who restores the prestige of democracy against the exploitive energy of oligarchs, then further by the rational bureaucratic Reichstadt of Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, who tempers the enthusiasms of both entrepreneurs and Democrats with his neo-Aristotelian state structure, uh, melding legally protected individual rights and organically interlocking social institutions. Of course, this sketch leaves out a thousand things, but it indicates the emergence of, liberal, of a liberalism recognizable, I think, in our own day. Indeed, if one takes these four as alternatives rather than as successors to one another, one can trace many of the varieties of liberalism and even modern conservatism to one or the other of those. Now, it should not be overlooked, whatever you think of liberalism, that it is arguably responsible for a number of practices and principles that we take as axiomatic in contemporary political life. The abolition of slavery, for starters. The development of the free market economy, which made slavery unnecessary and introduced unprecedented plenty. The emancipation of women from imposed restrictions on their education and their liberty. The promotion of science and the consequent technologies that have relieved human suffering and enhanced human possibilities. And the attention to the dignity and equality of all human beings, regardless of race or ethnic origin. Now, one could say that all of these achievements, with the possible exception of the second, the market economy, had their origin in Christianity. But I'm not sure that would prove more than that liberalism is a Christian heresy, as some have argued. For better or worse, liberalism has pressed for all of these more fervently than has the church, at least the Catholic church. Though it might be argued that extreme versions of liberalism and the reactions they provoke have undercut even these five achievements. 
the history of political philosophy, after all, doesn't end with Hegel or with John Stuart Mill, but proceeds through Marx and Nietzsche and much more. Now, I noted at the outset, but didn't mention here, liberalism's stance on religion, often listed among its accomplishments, its protection of religious liberty as the condition that religion accept its status as a private matter and concede to the state over, uh, I'm sorry, concede to the state authority over public right and wrong, as well as its ambiguity on the question of establishment, permitting a tamed official or state-supported church or churches in countries such as England and Germany, or demanding an ardently secular state in countries such as France. And this finally brings me to America, as promised in the title of my talk. There is no gainsaying that liberalism has been influential in American political development. All five of the achievements I mentioned, abolition, enterprise, women's emancipation, scientific advance, and human dignity, character characterize our history, many of them from the moment of the founding, and in some of these movements, the United States has led the world. And yet, there's much that they don't explain about us. Our republicanism, for example, and our constitutionalism our common sense and our resilience, and yes, our religious freedom and our religi religiosity, I think. In the time I have left, with the context I've established, let me try to make my case. The settlers who came to America and then moved west were enterprising men and women, but they were also Christians for the most part and brought with them the common law of England, the customary law enforced in courts of law. It is typical of custom that its origins are obscure, at least to non-historians. Uh, a, a custom was said to be good at common law if, quote, the memory of man runneth not to the contrary. But its origins, the origins of common law, were in Catholic England, even if its heyday came after the Reformation. And it was, I think, a carrier of Christian ideas. Moreover, the practice of courts to look for precedent as a record of custom and to decide new cases with reference to old, anchored an Aristotelian attitude in American legal thinking, presuming that the old was good until proven otherwise, which alternative, in fact, could sometimes be proven, though never presumed, for the law developed by reason, assimilating novel situations to principles tried and true. Traditional adages of justice, for example, that no one should profit from his wrongs or be a judge in his own case, were also part of common law, as was natural law, at least in the negative formulation that not, nothing against natural law could subsist in common law, though common law included by custom what Aquinas would call determinations of matters that natural law left open as indifferent. Liberalism, following Hobbes, defines justice as the command of a sovereign, or following Locke, as a rule promulgated by a legislative power. But common law has as its paradigm the people's sense of right and wrong. That's why cases of common law are tried by juries, protected by the Constitution, but not invented by it. Before a person can be deprived of his life or liberty or property by the state, he gets his day in court, not only to receive the protections of the law at the hand of the judge, but to be assured the chance to appeal to his fellow's common sense. Though common law presupposes, I think, a Christian, indeed a Catholic anthropology, often enough leaving matters to the individual's conscience and presuming an element of due process as an element of due process, his innocence until proof before a jury of his guilt, it must also be remembered that the common law arose under the English monarchy and was law in the king's courts. The Americans at the revolution cast off that monarchy and established instead republics. That required some changes in common law. For example, the abolition of primogeniture and entail, explicitly by legislative action in the new state of Virginia, but actually a long, as long ago as the uh, time of settlement in New England, where common law was held authoritative. The old English common law was held authoritative insofar as it was consistent with their circumstances and unchanged by their statutes. It being an adage of common law even in England, that a contrary statute supersedes the common law. Let me say that again. It's an adage of common law that a statute supersedes common law or can supersede common law. Along with the monarchy in England, there'd been, of course, an established church, 
not Catholicism, as you know, at least by the time of the revolution. But the canon law of that church was independent of common law and enforced in separate courts, making disestablishment almost seamless, though now and again, American courts were called upon to settle matters, matters concerning church property. Disestablishment, as you may know, was not immediate at the state level after the revolution. In some states, especially Rhode Island, Pennsylvania, and New York, it was already general practice by colonial legislation and the appearance from the early days of settlement of numerous religious denominations. Catholics were especially attracted to such places and thrived in such a condition of pluralism. Their experiment in Maryland having been ended in the late 17th century by the development of a Protestant majority and the feeling brought across the ocean in the wake of the so-called Glorious Revolution. In most of New England, the process was slower. Massachusetts not ending its con congregational establishment until the 1830s. In Virginia, of course, there was, so to speak, a battle royale with Jefferson and Madison leading the charge. At the federal level, the Constitution included a provision against religious tests for office and was soon amended to include a no establishment and free exercise clause. While some have suggested or just assumed the Virginia experience was emblematic and determined the federal solution, it is at least equally possible that the pluralism of religions among the new states is a sufficient explanation, at least of the no test clause, which after all, uh, goes on to prescribe an oath of office, and probably of the no establishment clause too. While the guarantee of free exercise, the language I believe is from the Constitution of New York, although Professor Munoz will correct me if I'm wrong about that, uh, uh, the free exercise clause tempts one to observe that the freedom of the church is guaranteed as, or was guaranteed as the first article of Magna Carta, and then to wonder whether there's some resonance. It's not so simple. Alas, it takes only a little history to know what church is the referent in Magna Carta. The First Amendment is more ambiguous as to who is entitled to free exercise, even as to whether the exercise is an individual right or a right belonging to congregations. Now, Professor Munoz, my host and your colleague uh, or teacher, has argued cogently that at the time of the founding, religious freedom was widely referred to as a natural right. I don't believe he means, and he'll correct me if I'm wrong about this, uh, and in any rate, I certainly don't mean that this is a natural right in the liberal sense in which Hobbes or even Locke spoke of natural rights, if only because the Declaration insists these rights are a gift of God and vindicated by his providence, something neither philosopher says so clearly. If religion is a natural right, it's not because one can choose to believe whatever one wants, but because, as even Jefferson explained, and as I believe the Catholic Church also teaches, one cannot profess as true what, according to one's own mind, one believes, uh, uh, one does not believe to be true. The underlying suggestion is not that there's no truth in matters of religion, that the whole question is idiosyncratic and thus optional, but that human beings as rational beings are sufficiently equal that all must discover truth for themselves or recognize a superior witness for truths we cannot on our own discover. The reference to natural rights in the Declaration and in the discourse surrounding it, in other words, does not commit one, I think, uh, to the philosophy of liberalism or for that matter to any philosophy. We acknowledge it in our organic law as we acknowledge the shared law of our constitution as a common discourse for our shared political life. It's not a political creed that replaces the genuine creed which we as Catholics profess. It is a discourse that I think Catholics can share in good faith, even if we don't interpret it, uh, its terms precisely as Thomas Jefferson or Roger Sherman might have interpreted those terms, much less as the liberals of our own day do. I should say the secular liberals of our own day. What the Declaration and the Constitution that fulfills it aim to secure, in other words, is political liberty, that is, Republican liberty, the right to participate in the governance of the community, which depends upon but is not limited to the right to govern oneself and one's own affairs. Religious liberty in American constitutionalism, in other words, is not the child of liberalism or only of liberalism, 
But the long delayed attempt to solve the problem of the two cities, well, that's overstated. I should say the attempt to adjust the relations of the two cities, for this cannot be perfect. Uh, uh, there is no perfect algorithm. To uh, this long delayed attempt to solve this when the city of man is Republican, not monarchical, and thus more plural and more dynamic. I think that was grasped by American Catholics, laity and clergy from the beginning. It was understood by the Catholic founders, such as the Carols. It was evidence in the reporting of Tocqueville, as asserted. Uh, it was asserted in the reply of uh, American clerics to the charge of Americanism as a heresy in the 19th century, late 19th century. It was proven by involvement of Catholics in the New Deal and the two world wars in the 20th century. It was vindicated by Catholic participation in the pro-life movement and the decision of the Catholic justices last year in the Dobbs case. American Republicanism, Pache, John Rawls, and his notion of public reason has always allowed religious people to bring the witness of their faith into the political re arena and to promote legislation and policy they think is right and just. Of course, no religion has been a national majority or has had a national majority. And it's very rare that any religion has a majority in any state. You have to make friends and build coalitions. And usually that can't be done by citing your own, uh, the authorities or the authorities of your own faith. But this, not withdrawal behind a feeble shelter of religious exemptions, is, I think, the nobler path forward not least because it has been the path of success in the past. It does require faith in America and in a providence that has protected her until now. Thank you. Okay. Shoot. Do you? Uh, Thank you, Professor Stoner. Um, we have a tradition here that we uh, allow our undergraduates uh, to ask the first question. So, any undergraduates with a question? Neo integralist or not? Or liberal, even liberal. Right? Do you have liberal? You have liberal. There's one. Yeah, let me bring the microphone to you. Hello, thank you very much. My name is Evan. I'm a junior and I'm in the Tocqueville Fellow Program. Um, my question was, when you were talking, you mentioned that you think the free market um, led to the, uh, the end of slavery because it made slavery unnecessary. And I was wondering if you could like, just expand on that a little bit. The free market is or it's kind of an interesting thing, right? It supposes it doesn't. It doesn't come after the end of slavery, right? It's not as if first slavery, in one sense, it's not as if first slavery has ended and then people think, well, how are we going to have enough stuff to live well? <laughs> and then they come up with the idea of the market. It's, it, and yet it, it's also sort of true that first you have to protect the right and recognize the wrongness of slavery and therefore protect the right of private property. That's the alternative, right? The notion, did I do that? We're being watched. I'm speaking because because I'm speaking well of private property. Said, so, oh, okay, okay. We're pretty good. Um, that first you protect that a person can own his own and has a natural right to own it, the products of his own labor, right? And then, lo and behold, people work harder because they're working for themselves. That's that same observation that Aquinas made, right? But he didn't pursue it or the scholars make people work harder for themselves. In fact, even work harder for the common good when they know they share in it. Prosperity is something we share, but here's the curious thing. Smith called this the invisible hand, right? We, we, we're, we're prosperous because we're actually working for our families to prosper, or even ourselves at first. Maybe better when it's your family and not yourself because you're less apt to squander <laughs> what you have. Although you might work, you also work harder too, I find, at least I did, uh, once, once you have a, a family. But 
but uh, but that said, uh, so, so so the free market works by energizing people, and it has it's just an empirical fact, right? It has lifted millions out of poverty. The alternative, the, I really think, the alternative to the free market is some kind of slavery or another. And so it's either the personal slavery of the ancient world, which we've rejected and rightly rejected, or it's going to be slavery to the state. And haven't we seen that already? I thought we had, but apparently not everybody remembers. And so, well, each generation maybe has to see this for itself. So uh, doesn't, now, free market doesn't mean oligarchic rule. Again, oligarchy was known from the ancient world. They say rule by the rich. But it's, uh, it, it, so it's got to be a market where there's opportunity, where there's a dynamic change, which allows for uh, improvement by individuals, new individuals, so to speak, who didn't start with wealth, putting their talents to work. And of course, I'm not saying that this is the only way to spend a life and the only good to see. But in fact, I think, it, again, that it's empirically been shown that the protection of property rights protects all the rights of, and liberties of civil society more generally. And that uh, everything from uh, 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 university, private universities or church universities, churches themselves, to, um, to, to NGOs depend upon this sort of, um, uh, this sort of freedom. Uh, newspapers, right, and, 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 the, and the press and a free press depends upon the freedom that a market supplies. Okay. Ready? Ready? Uh, hi, Professor. Good afternoon. Thank you again for being sure. here today. Uh, my name is Eddie Campbell. I'm a first year in the Con Studies PhD program. And I wanted to bring up uh, the like concept of the, concept of the judiciary in the American context uh, with, in light of Catholicism. Right, maybe why, in your opinion, have Catholics been so successful in securing appointments to the Supreme Court or to appellate courts when they've been marginalized or underrepresented in other areas of government? Does this have something to do with Catholicism itself or with constitutionalism itself? Yeah, Thank I'm not, you. I, I, I'm really not sure on that. I'm not a good enough soci sociologist, but it was kind of interesting a few years ago. Every member of the Supreme Court was either Catholic or Jew, right? And these are two, two religions that that think in terms of law and, uh, uh, and, and in terms of reason in law, right? Of a sort of, uh, uh, of the application of reason to determine how to act in any particular case. And it does seem that, curious thing, isn't it? That, that uh, religion is the protector of reason in this way. That's, that's actually one of the sort of curious discoveries of the 20th century, that reason, the, the reason of the Enlightenment or the, the rationalism of the Enlightenment ends up undercutting confidence in reason itself. And uh, uh, what the Enlightenment thought was the great enemy of reason comes, <laughs> so to speak, to the rescue. So that's, that's the best I can do on that one. Right. So I can't say it's a self-evident truth. <laughs> so, you know, self-evident, you know. Uh, no, right. Why, I guess the question would be why it would be, right? And it would have something to do with, well, I, I, guess, I guess in the end it would be, it, it's just inadequate to understand reason as only instrumental, right? Hobbes, again, if I could reference this, is, is the one who begin saying things like this, that reason is the, is, is, is the servant of the passions, the, the, what, the thoughts of the scouts and spies that go, go abroad and find the way to the thing desired. And then, uh, is it Hume, reason's the slave of the passions and put to work for that. And uh, I guess if it's the slave of the passions, then it's, it's certainly, it's not its nature <laughs> to be enslaved, right? Uh, but on the other hand, you have to have some kind of account of human being that can explain the nobility of reason. And maybe it, is, it has to be an account that, can exp that, that ties that 
nobility of reason, even though it is practical too and helps us govern our affairs, that ties that to a sense that the universe, the universe is rationally ordered. And uh, because that's, after all, what science shows us quite marvelously, right? And shows us again and again as it makes more discoveries about, uh, about natural things, uh, that, that there is a rational order to the universe and our reason can somehow participate in that. So it does two things. Of course, it helps us know, and then it helps us guide our actions. And how those two are connected, well, religion has an answer to that, you see. and. I don't think the Enlightenment really does. Hi, I'm Jackson Wolford. I'm a first year doctoral student in the theology department. Uh, first, thanks very much for a wonderful presentation. Uh, I had a question I, about what I understood as one of your later points, which was uh, that Catholics can hold the principle that one cannot uh, proclaim as true what one does not believe to be true. And that this forms a kind of point of, of uh, mutual understanding with the Catholic position and a, a sort of framers sort of understanding the Constitution. Um, as I understand the Catholic tradition as well, it also teaches, however, that there's a parallel obligation to form one's conscience in figuring out what one holds to be true. Uh, does that obligation create any tensions with a liberal frame even of constitution? And if so, how do we resolve those? Well, you, of course, correctly state the, uh, the Catholic position. Um, I don't think the Jefferson, it was the liberal I, I cited. Uh, Jefferson himself was a great advocate of education, right? So, so he certainly thought there was a requirement to form one's, one's reason. And, uh, some of the statements he makes, right? That, that he has this great letter. Well, he has a couple of things on liberal education, right? He has the great letter on liberal education to one of his nephews about what to study and what to read. Uh, and yet even greater, he founds a university. <laughs> Right. I mean, that's really quite a remarkable thing. And um, and and he cert he counted that in the declaration. Right. And the stature of religious liberty. So he brought all three of them up. Those are the three things on his tombstone. He didn't include third president of the United States, maybe because it was third and the other things were first. So, but um, but uh, but he. Uh, uh, but but there's a great document there that's in his papers uh, about about what the um about what the uh what should be studied and you know he has a he had a place for religion at virginia it was kind of curious how it was treated it was to be taught i think separately from the university itself right but each denomination was to be teaching its own theology nearby as i remember i i, I haven't looked at this in some years so i'm just trying to reconstruct it maybe i'll be wrong on this but i think that was his idea so that the different religions were he understood that was part of education, but that, of course, it couldn't be settled by the state <laughs> what you teach in theology. Uh, interestingly, John Courtney Murray has a chapter much neglected in, in his uh, We Hold These Truths, in which he suggests something similar. And he says, look, the state university, I wish they would do this. I mean, I've tried to, to, to suggest it to anyone who listened, and no one has yet at my own state university, but uh, the thought being that you have a Jew teaching Jewish studies and uh, Catholic teaching Catholic theology, and uh, so I guess it would be the Jewish law and Catholic theology, and, and, and have someone who's really expert in that field teaching it. And then as long as you have the plurality of it, you can avoid the establishment. So Jefferson had that in mind. He thought theology was something in that sense that was a part of study uh, and, and ought to be. And actually, I think one of the real problems, I once wrote something about this that got picked up by first things of all thing and then denounced by several different theologians, but nevertheless, uh, uh, saying that it's a real lacuna in modern American education at the best universities that Theology is treated as just private opinion or, or just sort of stuff you might pick up in the same way you would popular culture. You know, you, it happens to be your like or dislike and not a part of knowledge. And, that, uh, and, and as a result, your average liberal journalist has no idea how ignorant he is. I mean, ignorant he is about what theology is. 
or what religious law is. I mean, if theology is just a Christian term or principally a Christian term, then and call it uh, uh, the religious law or whatever it would be, according to the faith. But just ignorant of that. No, that's been a great change I've found in the last 40 or 50 years, at least the young, among young people, often at some of the best schools, they kind of learn they've got to pick this up. And so you know, these satellite institutions are kind of being established, not for credit, uh, for better or worse, but around, uh, around certainly the Ivy League schools and some of the others to, to really beef up the theological knowledge of students. But Jefferson... Jefferson saw that, so it, it's kind of curious. I, I don't think we can say he he missed it, but certainly the modern uh, the modern secularists do. Can, can I push Jackson's question a little bit? So <clears throat> Jackson said, "Well, don't don't we <clears throat> we have an obligation to form our consciences?" Yes. And this, it, the state's not going to do it. Now, one interpretation of this is, well, the state's not going to do it because it doesn't think it's important. That is, it's indifferent. But if I understood your your argument, you're saying, well. The state not doing it just means it's the responsibility of families and churches, right? So the uh, American yeah. constitutionalism is, doesn't reject uh, religion. Yeah. Uh, and making it private, it, it doesn't <clears throat> depreciate it. It turns that forming of consciences over to families, to non-state institutions, the family and church. Yeah. Jackson, he didn't push this, but he might say, to privatize in that way, to empower mm -hmm. families and churches and not the law, will necessarily lead to the current situation yeah. where religion right. is forgotten. Right. Right. So, so in, in the first place, I wouldn't say you have the state turning it over, right? I mean, the first thing I think Jefferson would agree is, well, the state can't form conscience, right? I mean, that's not how consciences are formed. Oh. Though there is a way in which what the state declares is illegal, uh, and and uh, insofar as you're taught that law is right or presumptively right, has a kind of effect on forming consciousness, but it's only part of it. Uh, my second comment would be that, but but the state is us. I mean, in a republic, right? So the fact that the government or the institutions of the government aren't fully forming consciences doesn't mean that the people, the people in taking their whole lives aren't involved in doing it. It's just we're not involved in doing it through the state. So you're. What's this for? I mean, there's a funny way, I guess, in which I'm suggesting you know, you're not a good citizen if you're not going to church, right? So whatever your church is, this is Eisenhower, mm -hmm. right? And uh, 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 it was funny. I was up at Hillsdale College a few years ago. Uh, Professor Nagorski mentioned he was just recently there lecturing, and it's become this model for American conservatism. And I did point out to them that, you know, they have statues of all these famous uh, Americans. I think all of them Republicans, including, you know, Frederick Douglass and uh, um, uh, 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 some others. And I noticed there was no statue of Eisenhower. And I mentioned that to them. <laughs> and, uh, of course, they laughed. But, but you know, Eisenhower's funny story. Uh, you know when he was baptized? The month he became president. He was, it's like after he became president, a few weeks later, he goes to, I think it was New York Avenue Presbyterian or whatever, because his wife had been Presbyterian, and, and gets baptized. I think it's the only time that happened. Um, and, uh, and yet he, he had been persuaded. I don't remember who it was. One of, the, one of the Protestant ministers persuaded him as president, sort of your duty to, to, uh, uh, to lead the country in a way <laughs> in that. So in a way, it's by model, I think, that, it, that it's meant to be achieved. And with a robust sense of Republican citizenship, I'm not sure that what the state requires is actually privileged over what people do on their own. It might be stronger because people do it out of their own initiative, so to speak, without being told they have to do it, or at least, I'm sorry, maybe being sort of told, but not being coerced by law to do it. 
So this would be the essence of the American experiment. I mean, it's an experiment yes. because a state is going to require virtuous people. but it's A state an- can't require virtuous people. I mean, you can say it is, but it can't make you virtuous. It can only, right, punish you for certain crimes. It can't. It can't. I mean, that's Jefferson's point. And I think it's a strong one, right? It can't make you. But it depends on virtue. It depends depends on on virtue, virtue. right? It depends on virtue, and it can't ensure that. And that that's somehow, I think this is the claim, right? That's somehow built into the the nature of um, uh, the nature of, uh, of, of human being. And that's why, I mean, that is something of an Aristotelian point in the sense that Aristotle defines the regime according to who rules, so that ultimately it's the virtue or the character of those who are ruling who give, who establish the character of the city. And we have this notion, again, of the institutions, and maybe we get this by a kind of reflection on the church, right? Because we're promised that somehow the church is this great structure that carries in it the Holy Spirit, even though it's sometimes hard to recognize in the particular, no, no offense to anyone here, but in the particular individuals who are filling the offices. But that's, that would be different. It has this different calling, this different charism, this different structure of authority. And uh, uh, it's really the character of political authority that it really does have to rise up from individual, from, from the, the souls of, of the people. And therefore, from, it reflects their virtues or their vices. But the state can't make you virtuous. Let's get as many more questions yeah. as we can. Okay. Um, let me go to the back. Luke, will you pass this back? And then... Hi, Professor. Thank you so much for spending your time here and talking with us. My name is Kaylee. I'm a senior studying political science and economics at Notre Dame. Um, my question kind of goes back to the first question you received from, from Evan. Um, kind of goes back to the idea on free markets. And I wanted to ask you, given you know the inequality that we have in this nation right now, and how a lot of people argue that's a result from you know the non-intervention from the state, from the free markets, a lot of people, uh, opponents of neoclassical economists argue that the demand supply curve does not necessarily tell you the truth uh, of the reality. And that's why we're having a huge uh, disparity of wealth in this nation. I was wondering, you know, from a Catholic perspective or a Catholic reading of the Constitution and all the foundings you told us about, you know, Catholicism in the Constitution, how how do you resolve the issue kind of between equality and free markets and using the concepts of, I guess, natural law, you know, common laws that you taught us about? Thank you so much. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, uh, I've always described myself according to that wonderful title of an essay by... um, Irving Crystal as a two cheers for capitalism fellow. So I'm, I'm not going to give a full, fully robust uh, uh, defense of everything in the market. But uh, here's what I'll say. Uh, first of all, wherever you have a free market, you'll have inequality. So inequ- if inequality is your aim, you've got to sacrifice freedom for that equality. Uh, you know, Tocqueville says that there's an extreme point at which liberty and equality meet, and that's so. But in practice in society, uh, to press too hard on equality or to be uh, too offended by inequality, it is uh, uh, your only remedies for that are going to threaten freedom. Uh, that said, Republican government depends upon a certain equality of citizens, right? Uh, you've got to have the fortitude to be able to stand up and say what you think. And that means you need some confidence that your basic needs are met and that you've got a home and, uh, and the like. That's why Republicanism really does depend as Aristotle uh, recognized on a middle class. It, It doesn't really work as, as, as including extreme rich and extreme poor, but a middle class, at least they have to predominate. I don't think that one should be offended by the very rich if that's the cause of widespread wealth, right? You can use John Rawls, I mean, in some ways to, uh, uh, I've I've often thought that although he may not have intended it, he actually justified the internet billionaires (laughs) Uh, because you could say what they did raised the the, the, uh, uh, standing and and the basic uh, liberties of, 
of everyone. And so uh, uh, that's all it takes to justify according to the difference principle. But he's also right, I think, in saying that your basic liberties have to be equally provided. And that's not necessary. Uh, there are going to be such temptations against that if the disparities of wealth are either too great or somehow there's no protection against their interference with uh, with individual liberty uh, and with with uh, with a basic uh, basic provision and independence of individuals. Right. You need independence. Um, I don't know that. Uh, one could be equal and even equally better off, but also very dependent. <laughs> and so. Uh, I would say you want the you, you want a certain equality for the sake of that citizen independence. I do think that in practice, there is a kind of natural tendency of markets towards the creation of oligarchy. I mean, right, the creation of of great inequalities. So I've always felt that it's legitimate, or, or thought it's legitimate for the law to figure out a way to sort of put the finger on the scale to bring to ensure that basic independence uh, uh sufficient wealth and, and, and independence and i think that's what in fact our country on the whole has done with more or less success at different times um you know i don't know if you've ever looked at the career of father john ryan uh who was the priest who was called right reverend new dealer but uh he was someone who, as a seminarian, had studied the newly issued Rerum Novarum uh, encyclical and uh, uh, helped create the Bishop's Committee uh, uh, on, I forget what the early name was, of it was, but they put together the program that eventually, much of which was later enacted in the New Deal. And so that sense of national responsibility for a basic minimum um, for people has a kind of ex Explicit kind of Catholic origin in American politics, and I think can be just. I I, I don't have any doubts that that could be justified and is consistent with the, uh, a basic Republican order. But that should be the focus. Now, part of that focus means uh, that good citizenship and Republican citizenship means valuing your independence and not just always looking for more wealth. You know, there was the adage. Right? I don't know. How it comes down to us, I know it's ascribed to Socrates, but a lot of things used to be ascribed to Socrates. Who knew if he said them? But uh, that Socrates used to say, "But I am rich because my needs are few." You've heard that that one. There's some truth to that, you know. If you figure out, if you figure out how to live on one income, it's a lot easier to raise the family, isn't it? <laughs> and uh, 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 but that means choices, and those are choices that one one faces and learns to make precisely as a Republican citizen, as well as as a player in the market. Now, I think it's a problem. It's a problem for the capital R Republican Party that many of its politicians seem to feel themselves inferior if they aren't as rich as the guys they're, they're talking to. I don't know. You get intimidated by talking to wealthy people. Uh, uh, well, that's a kind of curious thing. Well, if so, why? What would it take for you not to? I mean, you might know more than they do. If you know more about something than they do, why are you intimidated about it? It would only be because somehow this interpretation of our regime that wealth is the most important good uh, has distorted our Republican sense which I think was more characteristic uh, in the early days, but not only uh, most, most of the founding fathers were themselves pretty well off, right? Um, or many of them, no, not all of them, but, uh, and some of them lost fortunes, you know, that's American too. Uh, so I guess that's what I would say, that's a kind of roundabout answer, but I think that it's clear, I do accept that uh, the arguments that, that seem to show that Locke really was right, and, and, and Smith was right, that guaranteeing people uh, the ownership to the products of their labor uh, really does make them work more and, and produce more, and in a way helps through the market to, to uh, raise the, the prosperity of all. But the value of wealth, 
On that, I think Aristotle is completely right. It's, it's, it's not in itself. Wealth is only an instrument. Wealth is the instrumental good. It's for what can be done with it. And that's the most important thing to know. Although you also have to wait, have to have a way to pay the bills, right? And to support and to ensure your independence. Yeah, let's get, I know, yeah. uh, so you have to go to class. Yeah, or if you want to take a couple questions, I can say one. Okay. Hi, um, I'm Evie. I'm one of the theory grad students. Um, I just am asking you to expand on really the last line of your lecture that seemed to be in support of Professor Munoz's work. Um, so I'm wondering if you think there are any risks to Christian witness as religious witness from Christians being involved in the political sphere and whether you think those risks are greater or lesser kind of working through democratic means as opposed to kind of the religious exemption route that has been taken. I guess maybe to not stack the question too much, do you think there are any risks to Christ from Christians not being involved in the political sphere? Well, I, I, I think there are lots of different callings in all of this, right? I mean, we're Catholics for Pete's sake. Uh, you've got, you're going to say, well, no one can be a nun, right? You can't have a convent because that's what drawing this a Benedict option, quite literally. Yeah. Well, no, of course. Right. And, and, and so they're going to be different. They're different callings for different people. Uh, the risk of the political involvement, of course, is that when you're on the political stage, you're very visible and it could easily create scandal. I mean, of course, it has often created scandal when people who are visibly involved as Catholics or Christians then do something unchristian. Right. Or, uh, uh, and, and sometimes not even meaning to, you know, I, I used to, I mean, not to pick on anyone, but it always seemed to me strange that George W. Bush, who made being a Christian so central to his presidency, never talked of peace, <laughs> but only of war. Now, I mean, circumstances are circumstances. And, you know, when your country's attacked, as it was during his watch, war might be the response. I supported it, in fact, but he just never spoke of peace. In great contrast, say, to Ronald Reagan, who often did. And that was a curious thing. So, so um, and I think there's probably many situations we could pick people out in, in, in any, of, any of us, right? And so that suggests a certain prudence in putting oneself forward uh, uh, and, and a certain modesty in, in, in putting oneself forward as a Christian. But that would be, I think, one of the big risks. Right, is, is the risk of scandal. Uh, uh, on the other side, I, I, I am concerned that there is a, a, a sort of sense that the hard and frustrating business of, pro, of politics, it's just so easy to find a reason not to engage. Now, I mean, I have my own reason not to engage. I engage really sort of very little, <laughs> in part because as a professor, I think you preserve a certain, I found it works better <laughs> to preserve a certain distance from partisan politics and from identification too far with policy, partisan politics. Though so I accepted an appointment from the man I just criticized for an office that involved education. So, 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 uh, sorry, <laughs> I guess that was ungrateful. So there I illustrated scandal, but, uh, um, uh, but, uh, but I think that right now, at least, Right. There, there is a call. I mean, on the one hand, you know, there is there's great truth in the platonic observation that the person who should rule is the one who doesn't want to. Right. So I am a little skeptical about too much of an endorsement of political action um, because it sometimes seems to encourage <laughs> the wrong people. <laughs> uh, uh, you need the, the insight of someone who knows the value of what isn't gained through politics in order to really do justice when acting within politics. A ter terrific way to end a very good lecture. So please join me in thanking Professor Stone. Thank you. Is that what you wanted? That's it? Thank you. I know there are many more questions. Yeah, sure. Oh, sure. Come on up. Got some time. Sure.
Is that what you want to do? Yeah, good. Okay. Perfect. Oh, good. Good, good, good. A number of them had questions. Yeah, good. Okay, sure. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. So I have a question. It's kind of related to my thesis, actually. Okay. So you're a senior? Or? Yeah, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If I understood your lecture correctly, you the point of going through the whole kind of history of political theory is that there seems to be more of a continuity than people think between the tension between the, you know, the city of God and the city of man that we've seen in Boston and modern Through religious liberty, this is not a purely liberal, fucking liberal construct, it's also seen as broader. Yeah, it's, it's got to be seen as part of the tension, right. right, and a response to the tension, not a way of just sort of eliminating the tension so we don't have to live with it. Right. And I've liked that a lot. Yeah. Then do okay. you think that the, even like the presence of a heavenly city that we're not trying to institute on Earth that we are going to do
Thank <laughs> you. 